joined us. Um, you know, I am a, a, an attorney and a former special victims prosecutor. And during the time that I was doing these cases, um, we really didn't have a very good grasp of trauma. You know, we knew the basics, that people were traumatized by what they um, were going through, but we really didn't understand neurobiology. We didn't understand how it, um, how it affected their ability to recall details, um, you know, how it affected their ability to even want to proceed with these cases. And so um, we're really thrilled to be able to offer um, cutting edge training on what trauma response means and how it can affect the work that you're doing. Um, we understand that civil legal services particularly are so critical for crime victims. And so OBS has funded, uh, program, I think 61 programs have attorneys um, that are funded through a grant from us. And as part of that uh, contract, we asked programs to have their attorneys take this kind of training so that they would get um, an understanding of neuro, neurobiology of trauma, um, the mental health needs of their clients and, um, and even their own mental health needs in dealing with these very difficult cases. So OVS is just thrilled to be able to partner with NYU, with um, New York Legal Assistance Group, and with Columbia um, in order to bring this training. So Dr. Barry, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Shani and Elizabeth for that wonderful introduction. We have uh, some logistic items to, to talk about. Um, let's see if my screen will move. Okay. And Integra, our uh, assistant, will uh, walk us through these logistics. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Integra Feliciano. Um, you guys have probably saw my name on an email or two. I'm just going to go over some webinar logistics for today. So just so you know, this session is being recorded. Um, the chat feature is going to be moderated by Shawnee Ades. So if you guys have questions, you guys can direct them in the chat to her. Um, you will automatically be muted upon entering and please remain muted throughout the entire seminar unless stated otherwise. If you are joining us on a phone today, please use star sticks to mute yourself. At the end of the session, you will be invited to fill out an evaluation. Please complete this as soon as possible. Um, and if you wish to obtain CLE credit, there is a second evaluation to fill out. And um, relevant course material will be in it on the Google Drive and we'll also email you. As far as obtaining CLE credit, um, please use the registration link for information on CLE credits and an information with further information will be sent out after this training to get the credit. You must attend the entire training session. Name your session. So please, if you haven't already, change your name to your first and last name so that we can know that you are here and respond to both polls con confirming your attendance during the session. So if you have more questions, for more information, you can contact um, Shawnee at her email address, sades at nyleg.org. Okay, so our first session today is going to be presented by Dr. Ichu Berry. Her topic is called IPV, Effects on Mental Health and Need for Trauma-Informed Services for IPV. So Dr. Berry, uh, has obtained her MD and MPH. She's a medical director of the NYC Health and Hospitals, domestic and gender-based violence mental health collaboration and assistant professor at NYU Langone within the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, she is a graduate of Harvard Medical School, the Johns Hopkins Bloomsburg School of Public Health and Columbia University Psychiatry Residency and Fellowship Programs. She is an academic researcher and clinician with clinical expertise in early childhood and mental health, women's mental health, and trauma. She has experience in mental health research, public policy, and has worked with a variety of state and federal institutions, including the Centers for, Dis for Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the National Institute of Domestic Violence in the African American community. During her training, she led a citywide hybrid implementation effectiveness study on the evaluation of a mental health and intimate partner violence intervention within New York City Mayor's Office to end domestic violence, domestic and gender-based violence. 
Uh, Dr. Berry's research focuses on implementation science, service delivery, and material inter intergenerational transmission and impact of trauma on child psychopathology. Great, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Tegra, and uh, thank you to all the people who are here today. Um, you know, I'm very much enamored by the fact that we get the opportunity to share with you some of our thoughts and, and some of our research and what we know about mental health and intimate partner violence. In particular, what we've done is try to tailor some of what we know to be applicable to the lawyers. Um, because one of the things I wanna do in terms of my collaboration is making sure that information I know is got brought to you and vice versa. Uh, I'm a big advocate for breaking down silos and making sure that we are working together to better the health of um, families affected by trauma. So today, this is gonna be a kickoff event about IPB and trauma-informed care. Uh, this is just the, the, the superficial top layer because we have seven more sessions that are gonna go more into the nitty gritty of trauma-informed care. Um, I don't really have any financial disclosures, but I do receive some support and have had support received from the Chapman Perlman Foundation, the Leon Leo Foundation, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. The objectives for my talk today will be on the helping our participants understand the dynamics of IPD and how IPD impacts treatment. Um, hopefully participants will be able to identify key mechanisms of trauma-informed care and providing IPD services as well as participants will learn effective strategies for identifying trauma within their clients and be introduced to key terminology. I usually like to start my talk with a, a quote um, from Judith Herman, who uh, was really like the pinnacle of person in, in thinking about complex PTSD and trauma and intimate partner violence. Uh, incidentally, she was actually one of my uh, supervisors during my training in Boston, and so I um, learned a great deal from her. Uh, and this is one of the quotes I think really kind of captures what we're here today to talk about trauma. Traumatic events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. I wanted you to keep in the back of your mind about what that means in the sense that uh, trauma can really, really get under people's skin and really affect how they uh, view themselves, how they view the world, but also affect how they relate to other people who may be there to be of help and service to them. And so we are here today to understand what is trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed care is a strengths-based framework. And what I mean by that, by strengths space, is the fact that we want to make sure that our clients, we're reviewing our clients with the positives of what they bring to the table as opposed to the negatives, like what, what, what's wrong with you, but really what happened to you in terms of the strengths space framework that is grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma that emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety for both providers and survivors. So not only does trauma-informed care relate to how we think about our clients, but more importantly, it also relates to how we view ourselves as providers um, and people who are supporting the needs of our clients. And that all of this comes together to create opportunities for survivors to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. Part of the main, the four main tenets of trauma-informed care, you wanna make sure that uh, the individuals, the policies, the institutions realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand opportunities for recovery. We want these institutions to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, to be able to respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices, and ultimately to seek to actively resist re-traumatization. One of the things I wanna do um, is to in addition to that quote from Judah Herman, I also like to start off my um, talks by having a clinical case um, because it really kind of helps ground us and ground me especially about why we're doing the work that we're doing. And this case may be very reminiscent to some of your cases and may not be, or maybe there's some parts of it that you've heard or, or have not heard about, but really it's an opportunity for us to learn about what do our patients and our clients bring to the table so that we can understand better what's going on in their lives. So Patricia is a 31-year-old single woman who grew up in an abusive home. She witnessed domestic violence at home between her mom and biological father, and she herself was physically and verbally abused by her father before her mother divorced. She had been depressed since she was a teenager and took an overdose of pills once, but never got any treatment. 
She was currently in her second trimester with her first child that was unplanned. Her partner, who had been verbally aggressive, had shoved her for the first time a month ago. Last week, a neighbor called the police due to excessive noise from their apartment. Her partner is now in custody. Over the past several months, she had become increasingly anxious, sad, unable to sleep, and unable to focus. More recently, she has noticed that she's become irritable and was recently fired from her second job in three months. She wants to do the right things for her baby, but is not sure she can cope. So this is the first part of our participant interaction. And so I'm throwing out a question to you and please write your responses in the chat directed to Shawnee and she'll read them off. But when you hear that case, what do you notice? What's the first things that come to your mind? What worries you? What concerns you? What troubles you? What doesn't trouble you? What do you think is, are the positives in the case? Just giving a quick minute for some responses to come in. Um, so we've noted that she's in a relationship where there's domestic violence power and control pattern present, that she seems to um, want to do what's best for her child, that there are concerns as to her immediate safety, um, that she is here seeking help. Um, there seems to be increase in anxiety and negative feelings. Um, she doesn't seem to have that support system. Uh, there may be general trauma. Um, there's good signs that she is acknowledging um, that there are issues that are present for her. Um, and uh, a number of people that are, that are being flagged about, you know, that there's some real concerns here about um, mental health support needed. Um, is she disconnecting? Um, but overall this positive that right now she is talking to a service provider um, and maybe that's something we could hold on to. Thank you, thank you. Yes, wonderful, wow, that's very, very thorough. Thank you so much everyone who wrote in, um, absolutely. One of the things when I meet a client who's coming in and is in tremendous amount of strength, I usually open up by saying, you are here now. You know, that in and of itself speaks volumes, that for whatever reason, whatever is going on, you are able to get yourself here to talk to someone. That shows a tremendous amount of strength and resilience. And so really kind of making sure, again, thinking from a strengths-based perspective, that we're able to, some, the client was able to figure out how to get here. That's a huge, huge win and a huge, huge mark on the positives. And so I'm glad you guys were able to highlight that. Some of the other things that struck out to me about this case was that you know, she herself is uh, a victim of domestic violence in terms of just when she was a child. She was there, she underwent child abuse at home, physically and verbal abuse. Um, she also has a history of mental illness where she had a suicide attempt in the past, but was not able to get help for whatever reason, um, barriers, we name it, but she had had a suicide attempt in the past. And so that to me also puts her in a higher risk category. She's currently pregnant. Um, and uh, what we know from the literature is that pregnancy is sometimes a time where uh, abuse and uh, can actually increase and escalate, and even more so when the pregnancy is unplanned. Um, it, there tends to be a correlation with that and also leading to increases in abuse. Uh, the fact that she is pregnant um, and has intimate partner violence going on right now and has a history of mental health disorder does put her at more at risk for developing postpartum depression. Uh, and postpartum depression has negative effects for the, for, the, for the mom, but also for the child in terms of disrupting that attachment uh, piece. And then most recently, she's been, the escalation of violence and abuse has also led to more escalation in some of these symptoms that she's feeling, um, that she's seeking help for. Um, she's more irritable. And the fact that, you know, she's now been fired from her second job in three months, so this is functionally impairing. So this is getting at her quality of life. And then when we think about economics, one of the ways women are able to get leave a situation if they are, choose to, is to have the economic ability to do so. But now without a job, how is she gonna be able to do that? So there's a lot of things going on in this case. And I want you to put this in your back in mind as we go through the talk today and think about Patricia. So what is trauma? 
Trauma is experiencing or witnessing a serious injury, threat of death, and or violation of personal integrity. The experience evokes intense fear, helplessness, or horror, and extreme stress overcoming one's ability to cope. There are different types of trauma. So there's individual trauma, such as physical injuries, illness, assault, um, in Patricia's case, you know, physical violence. There's group trauma. Um, so after 9-11, first responders, there was a lot of uh, talk about how first responders also had infliction of trauma in their lives, military service members. Within the community, neighborhoods can be particularly affected. Um, you know, Sandy Hook, um, when that came out, that whole entire neighborhood had undergone a collective type of trauma. Reservations and Native American plant, uh, reservations also have a collective type of trauma, as well as historical trauma when you think about that too, such as generational trauma, slavery, um, and also the Holocaust. And then in addition to collective trauma, you know, there's earthquakes, hurricanes, but right now what we're all experiencing right now is COVID-19 and how that can also be uh, considered as a part of a traumatizing event. Trauma is widespread. And the reason why we're here today is because trauma is widespread. And with appropriate supports and interventions, people can overcome these traumatic experiences. In order to do so, we need to be able to have a system that increasingly views trauma as an important component of an effective system. It must be based on a knowledge and understanding of trauma and its far-reaching implications. And so now I'm going to take a step back and talk to you about what we know from the history and from the literature about trauma and talk to you about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, which is a very profound study, which I think really has encapsulated what we know so far about how trauma truly gets under the skin. So ACEs, otherwise you may hear that called the ACEs, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences, is a term given to describe all types of abuse and neglect and other traumatic experiences that occur to individuals under the ages of 18. And it was actually coined by uh, a study from out of Kaiser Permanente um, in California that examined this relationship of these experiences and how it relates to later life chronic diseases, morbidity, and mortality. What was truly novel about this uh, study was that it was a large study. So 17,000 people were uh, actually enrolled into the study and there were a lot of uh, different confidential surveys, questionnaires, uh, as well as coming into the, um, to the hospital and getting lab tests to understand that connection. Um, it was evenly split generally between gender, 54% female, 46% for six, 46 were male. Um, but also what was interesting too is that most of the people and the majority of the people in this study were actually middle class. And what they found was that trauma is pervasive. Um, they looked at three different categories of the ACEs, so abuse, um, so emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse, uh, household challenges, there were five of them, mother treated violently, or DV, substance abuse, mental illness, separation, divorce, or if a household member was incarcerated, and neglect, emotional neglect, and physical neglect. And um, out of these 10 types, what they noticed is that two-thirds of the people who underwent this study um, had at least one ACEs in their life, um, and up to 15% actually had four ACEs in their life. So again, really gets at this idea that trauma is pervasive. And, and again, it was people who were middle class. So when people usually think about trauma, they usually think about the lower socioeconomic, but this was people in the middle class who had this amount of profound trauma in their lives. And what was even more astounding was that they were able to show connections to the fact of chronic diseases such as um, uh, lung disease or uh, COPD or heart disease, such as uh, myocardial infarctions, which is um, like heart attacks or strokes, uh, obesity, substance use disorder. It was just a very progressive. So the more ACEs you had um, in a dose responsive nature, the more likely you were to have these types of chronic disorders and could actually lead to early death. Now, what I wanted to also point out is that the ACEs, so there are 10 at the top, the pair of ACEs here, which is more kind of individual basis, but there also needs to be, uh, can, you also need to take into consideration that, um, you know, there are also adverse community environments that put people at risk too, such as poverty, such as discrimination, 
violence in the neighborhood, poor housing, quality and affordability, lack of opportunity, economic mobility, and community disruption. And this is particularly relevant when we're now in this day and age thinking about this historical awakening about racism and discrimination. And although people, there's this awakening right now, this is not new information. This paper that was um, came out fairly recently, but almost uh, in 2010, actually, and kind of took quotes from people in 2002 and 1999, over 20 years ago, said that racism is a chronic form of trauma. And so I'm gonna read this. Uh, the above findings suggest that there are similarities in children's responses to racial discrimination and other forms of violence. The symptoms of depression, anger, anxiety, and decreased self-efficacy that are associated with exposure to racial discrimination have also been reported for children exposed to domestic, interpersonal, and community violence. Again, you know, I'm going to pause here for people to understand that, that racism is a form of chronic trauma. And all of these types of trauma that I've just kind of outlined have been connected to physical health as I outlined with the ACEs study, but more specifically, I just wanna to get to a little bit more detail. It affects tons of different organ systems in our body. So it affects our brain, our nerves, so people can talk about having headaches or feelings of despair, lack of energy, uh, affects our heart. Um, you know, And for that matter, actually right before I came and gave this talk and still right now, my heart is beating fast. And that's a sign that stress is getting, uh, stress is there. Um, but your stomach uh, can also be affected with sometimes having nausea, some stomach aches. Uh, the pancreas, which is one of the organ systems that's in control of helping us digest food by sending enzymes into our circulation, that can go haywire and lead to increase, increased risk for diabetes. You know, our GI system, such as intestines, you know, people complain about diarrhea and constipation, and also reproductive organs. Um, women can experience painful periods, reduce sexual desire when there's a lot of stress. Uh, one important thing is, is that experiences of stress and trauma are associated with poor health. And uh, this last part here, that psychological responses, particularly linked to negative health outcomes. And what I mean by this is that there is a mind-body connection. Oftentimes people kind of view them as a physical health versus mental health, but they're actually much more intertwined. And that your ability to, your psychiatric and psychological responses can also impact your physical health. So for example, like I said, I was feeling particularly stressed about giving this talk and my heart started racing. You know, right before this, my stomach was tight in knots. That is a mind-body connection and they can't always be separated like that. Now, this is a very busy slide, um, but the reason why I put it in there is because I actually kind of like it. It's an, it, it forms like this general base of the, our understanding right now of what the literature shows about how the mechanisms between stress and disease get, um, get infiltrated. And so we can talk about the genetic predisposition, um, you know, historical trauma um, that can also lead to disease and mortality, um, early life stress such as ACEs, uh, and in particular thinking about the timing, the intensity, duration, the role, and the type. This big middle section is where a lot of the research is coming to fruition from the NIH about what do we know? How does the body do this? And our body is so profound. But we do know that stress affects a lot of different channels within, um, within our cell system, such as our neuroendocrine stress, immune system, brain development. And we'll be having a talk uh, next week about brain um, development as well. Metabolism, sleep and circadian rhythm, and all of that can be influenced in terms of how we respond to stress. And there's usually room for actually adaptation and resilience. And I'll talk a little bit that, about that later. So intimate partner violence, this is why we're here, um, is a form of trauma in itself. It is a serious preventable public health problem that affects millions of Americans. Intimate partner violence includes physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression, including coercive tactics by a current or former intimate partner. And what we do know is that IPV has psychological impacts. Uh, the one that most people think about when they think about IPV and mental health is post-traumatic stress disorder. And what is it? Uh, so I'm going to play a video from Mia Hempstead. Um, she is an advocate who talks about what it's like to be living with, me, uh, with PTSD.
that's kind of what happened last October. Um, my mental health was, I was doing great. Honestly, I was seeing a therapist, but I was coming to an end of therapy for postpartum depression and anxiety. I was doing great. I had found my identity and value in motherhood. I had rid myself of all this mom guilt and resentment in motherhood. I was really thriving. And so my time with that therapist was coming to a close, but then I get called into court and obviously I don't have to go, but I wanted to go. I wanted the truth to come out. I wanted to stand up for myself and say, look, Sorry, it seems like I have to share this. My apologies, let me start again. My mental health was, I was doing great. Honestly, I was seeing a therapist, but I was coming to an end of therapy for postpartum depression and anxiety. I was doing great. I had found my identity and value in motherhood. I had rid myself of all this mom guilt and resentment in motherhood. I was really thriving. And so my time with that therapist was coming to a close. But then I get called into court and obviously I don't have to go, but I wanted to go. I wanted the truth to come out. I wanted to stand up for myself and say, look, you abused me. That's the truth. And you're not going to get away with it. Um, so, but what happened was, is something I'd never experienced before, which is even when I wasn't thinking about what made me anxious, even when I wasn't thinking about a negative memory, even when I wasn't reflecting on it or talking to anyone about it, my whole body felt like just so anxious. Like I just had, if fear was a physical object, it was like I had a weighted blanket around me and it didn't feel good. It didn't feel like a hug. It felt like I was being suffocated. I felt like all along my spine, I had something that was just holding me down and making me scared. And I didn't want to drive. I didn't want to leave the house. I would make myself because I have kids and I want to get them outside, but it was so hard. It was such a fight and a battle every single moment of every single day. And I couldn't shake it. And I couldn't understand why it was happening because I didn't have any specific memories that were coming to mind. I was like, why am I feeling this way? For a long time, I actually didn't even label it anxiety. I didn't know what was going on. And I, um, I had an experience where, I mean, obviously I knew because I had been practicing mindfulness for several years now. I knew that the only thing that really changed in my life, you can hear my daughter out there, the only thing that really changed in my life was that I had agreed to go to court. I'm like, it has to be related to this and it has to be something very deeply ingrained in my psyche because in my brain, because I am being affected even without thinking about it. So just the fact that I know I'm going to testify is really bothering me. And so I knew it was that, like I had that self-awareness, but basically, yeah, it was like, I was just so overwhelmed exhausted my nightmares came back in full force they were terrifying and vivid and awful and so i just started to unravel because unravel mentally and emotionally because without sleep obviously we start to unravel so i it basically felt every single day like even though i had gone to bed and was in bed for eight hours and was sleeping my night terrors were so vivid and intense that i would wake up extremely mentally exhausted and fatigued because my brain had been in overdrive the entire night of my sleep feeling as if i was running away from someone who was trying to hurt me so there's she goes on and on and on and talks more about what it's like, but that was kind of the highlight for her, but what it was like living with PTSD. Um, and so, you know, what do we know about PTSD? Um, we do know there has to be a traumatic event and then there are symptoms that go along with it. Re-experiencing avoidance, negative conditions or mood or arousal. So let's go through them. Re-experiencing. Spontaneous memories of a specific event, recurrent related dreams, flashbacks, or intense or prolonged psycho psychological distress. Check. Mia met criteria for that. She was talking about having these memories. She was talking about having dreams. She met that criteria. Avoidance. Distressing, like avoiding distressing memories, thoughts, feelings, or external reminders of the traumatic event. 
check. Mia said that she didn't want to go outside. She was trying to avoid going outside, even though she knew she had to, she didn't want to. So check, she also met that criteria. Negative cognitions or mood. Having arranged for persistent or distorted sense of blame to herself or others, to a stranger from others, or significantly diminished interest in activities or to inability to remember key aspects of the specific event. Again, check, she also meant that. She didn't talk about it specifically, but she did talk about this sense of just not wanting to, just feeling like something was out of place and out of whack and feeling like a lot intense anxiety. Uh, four, arousal. The appearance of aggressive, reckless, or self-destructive behavior, sleep disturbances, hypervigilance, or similar behavior. Later in the talk, she talks about having, being very hyper uh, vigilant in that she would uh, startle very easily if the door was slammed on um, and that, and so she also met criteria. So she met criteria for PTSD. In terms of the epidemiology behind PTSD, um, there's a lifetime prevalence around 6.4 to 7.8% in the United States. Uh, women um, generally have been diagnosed with PTSD more than men. Um, and you know, there are some questions about what that is. Is it gender related or it just has to do with the exposure and what type of events? Um, altogether though, most trauma exposure does not lead to PTSD. And what we do know, and this is from data out of combat veterans, is that 78% of combat veterans do not meet criteria for PTSD. So there's something that people are, that happens, um, that doesn't always mean that if you have trauma, you automatically get labeled with this diagnosis. But the likelihood of developing PTSD depends on multiple different factors, such as gender, and whether or not it's a, it's a cause or more a correlation, that's still to be debated. Um, but the age of the time of the event, um, if you have a history of ACEs that we just talked about, um, genetic predisposition. So if a family member, if a parent had PTSD, you're more likely to also develop PTSD. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but there is, um, you're a heightened risk. The presence or lack of social support um, can um, lead people to developing PTSD. If there's perceived harm, meaning that if you psychologically feel that this is harmful, this event is harmful to you versus somebody else who doesn't, um, then you're more likely to develop PTSD. Uh, the intentionality of the event, if you knew it was a personal attack, um, can sometimes also uh, lead to the likelihood of developing PTSD, as well as the um, intensity, the severity, and the duration of the event. This slide uh, was pulled from um, an article by Rachel Yehuda, who is a great researcher in PTSD. Um, and what she wanted to convey with this slide and what I want to convey with this slide, again, is the notion that not all trauma leads to PTSD. Uh, on the y-axis are the different trauma types, um, such as witness, accident, threat, attack, all the way down to childhood or, or rape. On the x-axis is the population, um, the percentage of population that's a, that has and represents um, these terms. The red is the prevalence of trauma. The green is the prevalence of PTSD, and the yellow is not developing PTSD. And the big takeaway I want you to, to come across is that despite the fact that witnessing PTSD, it has a higher prevalence in terms of the number of people who were exposed to it, it does not always lead to developing PTSD. But the two at the bottom here, childhood um, trauma as well as rape, has a low prevalence, but are more likely to lead to the prevalence of PTSD. One of the things that's interesting is that uh, people talk about complex PTSD. Uh, it was coined by Judith Herman, but it's actually not in the DSM-5. Um, there's a subcategory called disorders of extreme stress, not otherwise specified. Uh, but the reason why people talk about it and why it's kind of relevant to us who work in IPV is that uh, there is this constellation of symptoms, and you see it, we all see it, uh, uh, that suggests that a new diagnosis um, needs to be used in order to describe the symptoms of long-term trauma, that's long-term severity, duration, as well as the intentionality of it too. Um, and it can lead to these presence of these symptoms, such as emotional regulation um, that may include persistent sadness, suicidal thoughts, explosive anger or inhibited anger, um, affects consciousness, uh, including forgetting traumatic memories, uh, living traumatic events, uh, or having episodes where you feel detached from your own personal body, uh, what we usually call dissociation. Um, changes in your self-perception, where there's a sense of just feeling really helpless or a lot of shame or guilt, 
or I've had some clients tell me actually that they just feel like they're not like other people, but there's something inherently wrong with them. Um, and nobody else feels this way, so there must be something wrong with them. Uh, it could lead to distorted perceptions of the perpetrator. Um, so maybe idealizing the perpetrator or being really preoccupied about what the perpetrator is doing or being preoccupied with revenge. Uh, it affects relationships with others. Um, so that relational um, um, uh, partnership uh, where they may choose to just really lose friends um, through isolation or distrust or repeated attempts to search for somebody to rescue them out of whatever they're going through. And also changes this perception of the meaning of life. Um, so I've had some clients say, well, what's the point? Just this hopelessness and despair that kind of pervades things. So not only does IPV effect um, can lead to PTSD, I also want you to realize that actually there are a whole host of other psychological disorders that can arise from intimate partner violence. And it's actually the, the, uh, the rule that there should be comorbidity uh, rather than the exception. And what I mean by comorbidity is that usually when somebody's coming to me to get a diagnosis that should be evaluated, they usually leap with more than just one diagnosis. So it's PTSD and depression or PTSD and anxiety or depression and anxiety or substance use disorders. It's just this constant, like this array of different disorders that kind of come together. So not only does IPV can lead to depressive disorders, such as postpartum depression, can lead to anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, sleep troubles, um, bipolar disorders, psychotic disorders, personality, dissociative disorders, um, somatoform, which is like this preoccupation with body symptoms, uh, neurocognitive disorders, suicide attempts, and self-harm, and just this perceived sense of, uh, poor perceived sense of mental health. Uh, I am, uh, in some talks, I actually go into each of these diagnoses in depth, but for the purposes of this, I'm not, because I don't want you to do the diagnoses, actually. I just want you to know that this is what can occur. Um, but you do have access to my slides, which will be in the Google Drive, and at the very end of my slide deck, uh, there are PowerPoint slides specifically talking about each of these disorders, so feel free to go and, and view them. Um, in addition, the other takeaway I want you to get from this slide, in addition to comorbidity, is the fact that uh, the, it's directional. The relationship between IPV and mental illness is bidirectional, and that IPV increases the risk of mental health disorders, but they, mental health disorders in themselves also increase the vulnerability to be actually be susceptible to intimate partner violence. And also it's dose dependent and with the severity of abuse of more and more IPV can lead to more likelihood of developing a psychological um, disorder. One of the things that people talk about, or at least in, um, in the public layman's terms, is that physical abuse must be the worst. Uh, the fact that you're being violently hit or beaten or choked is worse. But in actuality, psychological abuse is just as bad, if not worse. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, highlighted that in 2012, they identified the psychological maltreatment as the most challenging and prevalent form of child abuse and neglect, more so than physical abuse. Uh, and, and really kind of led to, in this article, which is a great article too, led to the understanding that psychological abuse in itself has been correlated with more, more likely to develop these adverse um, psychological disorders such as depression, PTSD, and anxiety, more so than in the physical abuse. So again, I'm not trying to get you guys to be psychiatrists and diagnose your, your clients. I uh, just really want to highlight that there are a whole, whole, whole host of different disorders um, and they'll present in uh, uh, multiple different ways. So trauma survivors will exhibit some constellation of symptoms, whether or not they meet diagnostic criteria. Uh, so you'll see them complain about headaches, fatigue, low motivation, that they can't sleep, have tearful episodes, um, not wanting to be alive, worrying too much or uh, you know, not worrying at all, uh, not being in touch with reality, or uh, zoning out and dissociating, or having a paranoia. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight about paranoia is that it is a symptom um, that people say, I'm paranoid, I'm always watching out for things, I'm always looking behind my back. But we also need to trust our clients too. They could be paranoid for a really good reason that their abuser is actually following them, is actually stalking them, is actually hiding behind a tree. That could actually be true. Uh, so we do not want to discount that uh, at all. 
other thing I want to highlight too is traumatic brain injury, TBI, and non-fatal strangulation. Uh, this is an area that's generating a lot more response in, in, in the legal world, it's also in the mental health world, uh, that strangulation is a part of a cycle of escalating violence. We do know that if somebody has had been strangled, they're about 70% increased risk of per homicide. So it, it's, it's pretty profound and that we need to under, better understand it and identify it. Um, people who do undergo TBI or have non fatal strangulation have very similar symptom presentation to uh, a mental health disorder. Um, and sometimes neurologically, they can suffer from memory loss, decreased motor coordination, difficulty maintaining attention or poor judgment, but also their mood symptoms are also um, uh, that correlate with having TBI, uh, depression, anxiety, PTSD, as well as difficulty sleeping. One of the other things that's really interesting is that uh, both uh, TBI and uh, exposure to IPV actually increase. There's an additive increase in PTSD and depression that doubles your risk for developing those disorders when you have both TBI and intimate partner violence. And so what about the children? So I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm always thinking about children. What's going on with the children? Um, so there are effects, IPV does affect children. There's intergenerational transmission of trauma as we, I kind of alluded to, and that there could be something epigenetics and our genetics has to be transmitted. Uh, but also just that what we do know is that IPV in children, there's a risk for children becoming a perpetrator or becoming a victim. And part of it has to do with the effect on parenting. Uh, so IPV um, can have direct effects on children and also indirect effects. The direct effects themselves mean that one in three children who witness IPV are actually abused themselves. Uh, but the indirect effects are that it influences the caretaker's parenting style. And that it would be uh, part of the fact that, that just the caretaker may have their parenting style being affected. Um, and now I think I'm going to pause um, for a polling. Yes, anybody who is here as an attorney requesting CLE, please pay attention to the poll on your screen. I'm going to give about 10 more seconds for this poll before we continue. If you haven't responded. Thank you. Thank you. So intimate partner violence affects children um, because of parenting style, but it also really, uh, and we know this as early as a perinatal and postpartum period, like the while, while a woman's pregnant as well as when you're postpartum, um, that maternal depression and PTSD can impact the emotional availability um, of the mom or the parent um, to be able to connect and bond with their child. And that in of itself can also affect the infant temperament. And what I mean by infant temperament, like if a baby is just a little bit too colicky or too clingy, too clingy or too uh, irritable, um, we know that there is a, an association. Um, and from st research, what we do know is that the first year of having intimate partner violence that first year is actually associated with 12 months of having infant difficulties regulating their emotions at 12 months. And this is what the mother will report, as well as an outside viewer who is, should be objective uh, will report as well. So it does impact bonding and attachment. And now I'm going to play a video um, to really kind of highlight what I mean by attachment and, and uh, dysregulated trauma. Yeah. 
in a still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So even though I've seen that video multiple times, it still pulls at my heartstrings. So I'm some of you probably were also feeling that way too, um, but it really kind of encapsulates what we mean by attachment and bonding uh, and how it's so useful and crucial in the first uh, several years of life. And so it kind of harkens to attachment to theory, which is this notion that infants engage in attachment behaviors in order to ensure safety and get their needs met. And it's really actually more of the infant and the parent and the caregiver, because we like to think of the infant, people usually think of the infant as one person and the parent as one person. But in the early years of life, it's actually, they form a unit and we call that the dyad. And that dyad feeds off of each other. And so the infant is gonna respond and the parent's gonna respond. And when the parent responds, the infant responds and that in and of itself forms that relationship. And this stability of that attachment to be able to have a responsive caregiver forms a secure base from which children can explore the world. So for example, if a child feels very secure and safe in their caregiver, they are more willing to go to play in the monkey bars or go on that swing set uh, because they know that there'll be a safety net to protect them should anything happen. Uh, the relationship with the primary attachment figure forms this working model of interpersonal interactions that a child will carry forward through their life. And so that means that having that stable force between the caregiver serves as a purpose to uh, maintain a template for how interpersonal individual reactions with other people should also be. But if that development becomes crossed or haywired, um, then we can lead to development of trauma and attachment dysregulation. So most of the literature comes out of ch small children and young infants, but it's also very applicable to adults um, because when we think about intimate partner violence, that relationship with their partner is an attachment piece and is a relationship piece. Uh, so trauma that happens in childhood at the hands of a caregiver is doubly destructive because it destroys attachment relationship that a child would normally need to depend on to manage trauma of abuse. If you have that safety net, you're much more likely to tolerate something bad happening as what the the uh, person in the video said. 
Um, survivors of childhood trauma have the dilemma of having experienced both the overwhelming effects of abuse and the absence of adequate soothing or comforting. So again, when we think about the ACEs study, um, there was abuse, there was household dysfunction, and there was neglect. So if there's attachment dysregulation, there is a checkbox in the abuse and also a checkbox in the neglect piece. Impaired early attachment can have lasting effects on learning, emotion regulation, executive functioning, threat perception, ability to form stable relationships, thus potentially increasing the likelihood that the individual will experience trauma and that they will suffer more severely from those consequences. Even the absence of further trauma, the impact of trauma, mental illness, and impaired attachment models in parents may impact their ability to provide a stable attachment framework for their children's development. And what's really, what the things I want to take away from this too, again, so most of this literature is in infants and in the parent-child domain, but again, it can also be applicable to what we think about with our, with our clients who come to the office. There was some disruption in that attachment to their partner. And also they may actually bring that into your sessions too, because that framework that they had will also be maybe translated to how they view you and the, your relationship with them. And so this can lead to dis, dis, uh, dis difficulties and barriers when you engage with a survivor. So what are some of the relational triggers of the past? Um, so maybe their perception of not having a very stable home life, or maybe their perceptions of having an abusive partner uh, or recreating that. They may recreate that within their own uh, interactions with you and the work that you do. And especially when you bring into the fact that you, were, you are a lawyer, they are coming to you because you have some type of power there's going to be perceptions of power and uh, power differential and power and control. On top of there's social cultural implications too. Um, you know, for I, my, I'm Nigerian American. And so my parents instilled in me from the very beginning that you should always respect your elders, like whatever they say, even though they could be wrong, you should still believe them. And so then that's also a power and control thing, but also there's a differential response about how people may review you depending on your age or your looks or your gender, whether or not you speak the same culture or come from the same culture or speak the same language. And talk about the environmental setting. Is it comfortable? Is it dark in your office? Is there physical distraction? Are the windows open and there are things running around that could really kind of impair um, somebody who's really coming to the table with some type of neuro neurocognitive dysfunction? Is there privacy? The other piece to think about is what about the physical parts of the patient and the client is coming in? Could they be in pain? Is that why they're having a hard time responding? Or are they comfortable? Are they tired because they just didn't sleep? Were they having night terrors like our person Mia who talked about PTSD, who's having night terrors and just couldn't concentrate? Or are there sensory deficits? In addition, what about some of the psychological barriers? Um, as we initially talked about the shame when recounting the narrative, the disruptions in memory and concentrating, uh, re-experiencing, dissociating while they're recounting the narrative, detachment from emotional responses, distrust, even hopelessness. Like, what's the point? You know, these are a lot of the stuff that's also that survivors are bringing, which makes it hard to engage. And I wonder if there are other things that you guys encounter in your everyday lives when you interact with, with clients. Um, please put in the chat and, and Shawnee will read some of those out so we can have a discussion. Just giving folks a minute to be able to, to type in. Anything that that people notice when they're engaging with survivors. We had a couple people write in anger, um, avoidance a lot, avoiding responding to text messages, phone calls, becoming frustrated when we ask questions, being oppositional, frustrated with the court, the judges, the general process, self blame, repetition, people feeling the futility towards justice and the legal system perhaps sharing too much information, um, mistrust, uh, being disconnected, um, not being able to engage directly one-on-one, -on -one, seeming to not understand what it is that's going on even though they've previously shared capacity to have understood, um, lashing out at who they blame for not being able to access what they're viewing as um, justice or what their goals are, 
minimizing situations. Um, and I'll end here, but there, there's a lot of people that, that talk about, you know, general frustration, feeling like there's not a lot of response by the people that are, that are engaging with them and, and mistrust um, when that happens. Absolutely, absolutely, all of the above. Um, and a lot of it probably can do with just the system itself, but also what the client is bringing to the table that they may not be able to trust their, their parent because the parent wasn't there, or they may not be able to trust the other adult caregivers or, or their partner because they lied to them. And so bringing that into the table too really impacts and makes it hard for you as a, as a provider and as a lawyer to actually kind of break down some of all that stuff. Like it took years for them to get to that point and it's gonna be much harder for you to break that down. But there are there is hope. But you know, I think part of what it is is just actually being able to identify that in your client um, so that you know, okay, this is not me. This is something that's going on. This is the trauma that's bringing it to, to the forefront. On the converse, are there barriers in ourselves so we talk about what the client uh, is bringing to the table. But again, when we think about the relationship, it is a relationship. The client has stuff, and then we ourselves have stuff um, that we're bringing and feeding into that relationship. So are there things that we as providers that we're bringing to the table too that affects that relationship? You know, the fear of what we might hear. Um, so for example, if, they're, if a client's telling you a story, but it reminds you of another story that you heard a few years ago, which was the most terrible story ever, and you were just like, I can't go through that. That is also a barrier in ourselves because maybe we will shut down uh, in terms of not hearing it thoroughly. Or the fear of not knowing how to respond. We're supposed to be in this position of being an authority and knowing what to do, but sometimes we don't. And that can also be reflected in how we connect with our, with our clients that we may lose composure. I may start crying once I hear about this terrible traumatic event. What am I gonna do now? Um, are there moral judgments that we have in terms of disapproving of what the client's choices are, that the client may choose to go out drinking and we just don't approve of that? Um, will the client, that also affects it. And you know, particularly because I want to highlight the fact that our clients, especially who have had long histories of abuse uh, and re-victimization, they've learned some adaptive, we could call adaptive skills, and that one of the ways in order for them to survive is to be highly attuned to the other person. And so, and they are able to read the faces, the micro little changes in our faces or body postures to, and try to respond so that they don't get hurt. And they may bring that to the table too when they're interacting with you. So if you respond in a way that they are able to pick up, you may not be able to see that you're doing that, but they can pick it up. They may view you a different way. Um, and so that's also something to be, to be rec to recognize. And it is a, it is a, a process of adaptation for them to survive. And so just being aware of that. Also the idealization of trauma survivor that like, oh my gosh, this person got here, they picked themselves up by their bootstraps are doing so well. And then something happens where you are like, oh, well, I don't know about them anymore. And that's common too. Uh, but there's, again, there's stuff that we bring to the table to, in terms of this relationship. Um, are there other things that you feel like go along and, and that are a counter that you feel that also kind of can lead to some barriers? And please write them in a the chat and, and Shani will read them out. We've gotten some good things already. One is um, coming in with an acknowledgement of our ignorance, that we know a lot about what we're doing, but we don't know a lot about the person they're coming in here about. And so what they recognize as signs of serious harm, we might not be able to, and we need to keep that awareness. Um, also that many of us um, are in this work because we're helpers because of our own personal lived experiences. And so we have to be aware of our own triggers and projection and our own trauma responses because um, you know, coming in here to serve is, is wonderful, but we come in here with our own experiences too. Um, some things that were mentioned, some things that came about with COVID, that right now the way that we have to engage is really different. Um, engaging through technology, um, having to limit our access even more than we already were limiting access before, it is something that we haven't had to struggle with and we're still working out um, how to do that well. Um, Somebody said sometimes it's just that wrong day where you're a hot mess, and that's true. We all have our days. 
Um, and trying to find that right balance. Um, how do you balance not losing composure and over-identifying with appearing empathetic and open to hear more? Right. Wonderful, wonderful points. And, and, you know, I'm very, very thankful to know that you guys are coming to the space, being mindful of that too, because sometimes we can put a block. We always think it's the, pay, the client, the client, the client, but, you know, part of this work is also taking stock of who we are as a person. Um, and so I'm, I'm very thankful to hear that a lot of you guys are also taking that time to be mindful and present about that. And there are a lot of questions. We don't have all the answers. You know, I've been doing this for years and there are definitely times where I'm like, I'll read um, a little snippet of the client before the client's coming in. And I'm like, holy shit, excuse my language. What's going on? What do I do? But really kind of taking stock of what, I, what I'm feeling and kind of using that to engage. And there are several other topics that are gonna come after me to, that will go into more in depth about what to do in those moments. And so we talk about the risks, the risks is risks and the symptoms. And what about resilience? Because you know there is trauma, trauma is widespread, but there is also recovery. So we talk about the prenatal stuff, the sex genetics and exposures, the, the mental pieces, the attachment, the ACEs. We talk about the pre-trauma stuff, such as socioeconomic adverse community events. Also, if there's a psychiatric disorder, which puts you more at risk for developing IPV and then the violent exposure. And then the trauma in itself, which can also be due to the type, the intensity, duration, frequency, if there's any type of injury or TBI or any type of physical manifestation. And then after, this is where the resilience and the support, and this is where lawyers come into play too. You may not think of yourselves as actually being an intervention for hope, but oftentimes you are that person where somebody can come in to talk about uh, what's going on in their lives. And being a source of safety and comfort and support um, can be very, very valuable. And there's lots of research to show that social support can actually reduce the risk of developing a disorder and also improving resilience. So safety, support, and psychoeducation, and then also some treatments as well, which other, uh, uh, other speakers will get into that a little bit more. And it becomes a long-term thing. Um, and there'll be times where people will move back and forth on this resilience and hope pathway, um, especially with COVID-19 right now, we are seeing a lot more of triggers of that type of trauma um, that people are feeling a little bit um, um, unstable but the, it is still on that pathway of hope and resilience. And so, you know, talk a little bit more about what resilience, recovery, and post-traumatic growth means. So resilience is the ability to absorb strain and preserve or improve functioning despite the presence of adversity. Uh, it doesn't mean you're just gonna snap back. That once you become resilient, you're gonna be the best person ever or what you were before. It doesn't mean that at all. It also doesn't mean that you're unchanged. Uh, what resilience really means is that whatever happened to you you know, you can use that as a way to, if there's a silver lining, use that as a way to really kind of recover. That is part of you now, and that you can find new meaning, reaffirm your values, reaffirm your purpose in life um, to be able to get through challenging times. Also in terms of recovery. So even in those with higher levels of distress or meeting clinical thresholds, recovery over time is the norm. So people do improve. Uh, it's important to support that recovery through both systems and individual resources, particularly for those at most risk. And so recovery is like, you know, those reduction of those symptoms. It doesn't mean people are cured, but there's a reduction. They're able to function more. So when we think about Patricia, who wanted to be able to cope, you know, she wants to be able to recover, that she's going to have those symptoms, but she's going to be able to hold a steady job. She's going to be able to use some of that um, trauma to be able to move forward in her life and be able to be that mom she wants to be for her child. And the post-traumatic growth, um, that even disasters or traumatic exposure can reorient our values and goals in a positive way. Um, and in particular, what we're seeing right now, especially with COVID-19, not only with our clients, but even with people, um, just colleagues, people are really taking stock of what are, what are their priorities, what do they want out of life. I've had several colleagues who've decided, you know, I wanna be closer to my parents, so I'm gonna move. And that's okay, that's part of the process of understanding what this event has done and why you want to reorder and reprioritize your, and reorient your values. This slide here is to talk about the fact that, you know, sometimes a little bit of adversity can be good. Uh, 
So these scientists were, were like, oh, we're going to build the best tree. We're going to grow and develop this best tree, which is going to be beautiful. We're going to create this environment that's going to be safe and will have the right amount of light, the right amount of soil, the right amount of sunshine, the right amount of water. And we're going to put in this arboretum. Uh, and what they realized was that the trees did not grow. Uh, but when they took the trees outside of that nice glass, beautiful constructed arboretum and took them outside, the trees started to grow. And what they realized is that the trees needed wind. Wind was necessary in order for the trees and the, the roots to actually dig deep into the ground, into the soil, and have strong roots and stability to be able to grow. So the, the wind was there to actually help those roots form. And so even though you see this tree bending and bending and leaning, it's not breaking because it is adapting to the adversity and it's making that tree stronger. So a little bit of adversity can actually be beneficial and can actually be needed and necessary. And so, you know, with all that being said, there are still challenges. Even though we talk about trauma, we talk about resilience, we talk about coping, we talk about adversity and, and making meaning and understanding that relationship, there's still a lot of challenges and working in a system that can be, you know, adverse to some of our clients. Uh, this is a quote from Judith Herman that I'm going to read to kind of encapsulate what it means for, for clients who are engaging with the legal system. Victims need social acknowledgement and support. The court requires them to endure a public challenge to their credibility. Victims need to establish a sense of power and control over their lives. The court requires them to submit to a complex set of rules and procedures that they may not understand and over which they have no control. Victims need an opportunity to tell their stories in their own way in a setting of their choice. The court requires them to respond to a set of yes or no questions that break down any personal attempt to construct a coherent and meaningful narrative. Victims often need to control or limit their exposure to specific reminders of the trauma. The court requires them to relive the experience by directly confronting the perpetrator. So to break it down, there are these challenges. Part of it is just engaging in this legal system um, and how it affects your mental health. So in that video with Mia, one of the things she said was that, you know, my TTSD came worrying back because of the thought of going to court, the thought of having to, you know, talk to other people about this trauma made her feel a certain way. And that's a challenge when you're trying to have a client who may not be ready to actually to, to testify. Also the idea of choice. One of the things about trauma-informed care, and I have other sites to talk about what we mean by trauma-informed care, is choice. Sometimes there's no choice in whether or not a survivor will will have to engage in the legal system, especially if there's any issues about child custody, they have to engage in with it, even though they don't want to. They have to see the abuser if they want to do handoffs, even though they don't want to. So there's little choice in that regard. Or if this property that needs to be dealt with, there's little choice. And then concerns about credibility and reliability. This is one area that I feel like a lot of my clients also have concerns about, like, are people gonna trust me? Are they gonna believe me? You know, this idea of like, is something wrong with me? Um, really comes into play and when they have to go on a witness stand or they have to recite a trauma narrative, is it going to be reliable or is it going to be credible? Are people going to truly believe me and want to help me? And then on top of that, you know, because if they are coming to the, to the forefront with any type of mental health disorder, they view that as stigma and so they may avoid using prescription medications. Maybe prescription medications are there to help them sleep, to help them no longer have those nightmares. But if they choose, think that the, the medications are going to be used against them, they may just suffer through that. Or they may avoid having a certain diagnosis or actually going to seek help when it could be helpful because of that stigma and how it's going to be used against them. The other piece about challenges in the law, which I found so fascinating, was you know, the idea of mandated reporting versus confidentiality or privilege. So in the mental health world, you know, we are mandated reporters, meaning that I, my license um, tells me, is again, it, it has to tell me that if I view the fear that a child is going to be in danger uh, with, through DV, witnessing or being exposed, I have a duty to report it. Uh, otherwise, my license is going to be revoked. Um, that is what it means. Whereas with the legal system, it's the actual reversed. You have a duty to actually uphold the privilege and confidentiality of that relationship with your client. Otherwise, if you forget that or forgo that, your license would be revoked. Um, 
so it, it's that yeah that nebulous area that I find so fascinating between our two fields and uh, you know it's challenging I'm still perplexed by that in terms of how do you hold on to that fear and and have ways of dissipating and we'll talk about a little bit about that later um, but also the association with traumatizing event or place of person and, and I put it here in, um, in parentheses transference so this is a term we use in our field about the idea of how uh, a person may actually ascribe certain uh, events in their past to you because it reminds you of something else. So, uh, for example, if a client comes in and they have to talk about their traumatic event in your office, they may view your office as a traumatizing place because at that moment they had to relive through this traumatizing experience. And so if they always have to go to your office every week, it is going to be hard for them to get through that. And on top of that, being in the system that is in and itself is re-traumatizing, like the legal system. Again, going back to Jim Herman's quote, like they're being forced to do something that they may not want to do. Um, they don't have a choice. Um, they just have to do it and they have to tell their story. And that in itself is, uh, can be triggering for, for some of our clients. And all together, I mean, these are just highlights of some of the challenges. I'm sure you have more and we'll get to it with some questions at the very end. But for these reasons, you know, the legal agencies that use trauma-informed service frameworks may find it worthwhile to collaborate with some mental health providers to kind of take off some of that blame and take off some of that, um, that, that burden. Um, and part of the idea is like trying to work together as a collaborative um, teamwork, you know, an in integrated team or collaborative team or consultative team, like having a mental health professional or some that you know can also share, find some of these ideas off of, as opposed to work independently, which leads to more burnout. And we have other talks who are going to talk about that. And so one of the things we're doing here in New York City is actually developing some of that collaboration. So having a call to action, mental health and DB. And so, you know, I'm the medical director at the Family Justice Center Mental Health Collaboration, where we embed psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers into the Family Justice Centers to kind of help, you know, have those clients come to us if they're feeling they need, but we also are there to provide support to the, our, our colleagues, our lawyers, who are also um, hearing these, these cases and these stories. So going back to why we're here, what is trauma-informed care um, and how does an organization go through it? Trauma-informed care is an organizational response to the needs of trauma survivors that ensures environment policies and practices will not re-traumatize or re-victimize survivors. It realizes that trauma is there, is widespread, and is pervasive, um, whether through individual means, through uh, group means, or through systemic means too. It recognizes that there are symptoms of trauma and how to respond to it and how to adequately respond to it and to also effectively resist re-traumatization. Some of the core principles of trauma-informed care is awareness. Again, being aware, like you can't do anything unless you have some education about it. Um, if you're not mindful of the fact that what you're bringing to the table, you may do more harm than good. Ensuring that there's safety, uh, not only there's physical safety, that their abusers uh, or anybody else is not going to get in the way, but also emotional safety, that they feel safe enough to feel comfortable sharing their story with you. You want to build trust, uh, making tasks are clear, but also setting appropriate boundaries. And uh, one of somebody wrote in about how to establish boundaries, and uh, I'm not going to get into too much today, but we do have subsequent talks that will. But making sure that um, you have a better sense of how much you want to take on and how much you don't want to. So you don't want to promise too much because you could leave, um, somebody could feel let down. And really establishing a tr choice, giving respect and prioritizing a client's choice and control around this area and collaborating by you know, sharing of power. Should we do this? Should we not do this? What do you want? How can we help you? And but through that, really kind of empowering what the client wants and empowering them to make those decisions and really enforcing the skills that they do bring to the table. They have some skills that brought to the table and really capitalizing on, on, on those areas. And so some tips, again, recognition and problems of trauma, assessing it, you know, focusing on what happened to you versus what is wrong with you. Um, and, and, and that part in particular is going from that strength-based framework. So what is it that you're bringing to the table? How did you get here? As opposed to, you know, there's something deficient in you that's wrong with you. Recognizing that, you know, some environments are re-traumatizing and, and being very plain and upfront about it. Um, 
you know, thinking about the language that you use when you're referring to your clients, um, not only with them uh, directly, but also how you think about them um, and consciously too, because if you think about it consciously that somebody's manipulative, it is going to change how you actually respond to them too. Um, your thoughts will influence your behaviors. Um, and that maybe the fact that they are manipulative or needy or intentious thinking or are calling you 24 seven because they wanna get an answer really may have been because of how they grew up, that it wasn't a behavior that had worked for them, that allowed them to survive, that they needed to be um, get your attention because they grew up in an environment that was neglectful. And so they need to use that in order to get what they want. Um, and maybe that's an adaptive behavior um, and so recognizing that too. And then as well, including everyone in your agency, uh, because it's not just you, you know, that reflects with clients at the whole system. Uh, at the bottom here, I say universal precautions apply to all because they do. And what I mean by universal, universal precautions, so this is a, a medical term. Uh, and really what it captures is like, what are the basic core things that you need to do in order for the whole system to operate? So in medicine, you know, one of the universal precautions is uh, washing your hands. Um, you know, wash your hands so you don't spread diseases and the germs. It's common sense, but everyone needs to do it in order for it to work uh, effectively. And that's the same thing with trauma-informed care. Everyone needs to do it so it can work effectively. So for the governments and leadership, how does your agency leader communicate support and guidance for implementing trauma-informed care? How does your agency's mission statement um, lead to that commitment to be able to do that? What about the policy that's in your institution? How do the agency's written policies and procedures include a focus on trauma and issues of safety and confidentiality? Um, how do human resources policies attend to the impact of working with people who have experienced trauma? And what about the physical environment? How does a physical environment promote a sense of safety, calming, and de-escalation, not only for the clients, but also for the staff? Uh, how has the agency developed mechanisms to address gender-related physical and emotional safety concerns um, in terms of, you know, uh, the bathrooms? Like, what are the signs around the bathrooms? Engagement and involvement. How do people with lived experience have the opportunity to provide feedback into the organization or quality improvement processes for better engagement and services? How do staff members help people identify strategies that contribute to feeling confront, com comforted or empowered? Is there a transparency in the work that you're able to do? Are clients able to give feedback? And then highly in cross-sector collaboration, as I, as I mentioned, is there a system that's in place that allows for uh, your institution to partner with another institution to work collaboratively and share the responsibility of trauma-informed care? What are the mechanisms that are in place to achieve this? You can say this, but are there are concrete mechanisms and areas and workflows that allow you to do that? In terms of screening and assessment and treatment services, are those timely? Are we doing it in a timely way that actually makes sense for our clients? And is it client-centered? In terms of training and workforce development, how does the agency address the emotional stress that can arise when working with individuals who have had traumatic experiences? Are they aware of vicarious trauma and are there ways that they're also trying to combat that within their training and workforce development? Are other support staff included? You can talk about this for lawyers, but what about the people in your office, like your assistants and your associates and research assistants, are they included in this type of work as well? Are all staff included? <laughs> what about progress monitoring and quality insurance? Is there a system in place that monitors the agency's progress in being trauma-informed? Is there opportunities to gather information to actually really kind of talk about, is this working? In terms of financing, is there a built-in budget uh, that includes funding support for ongoing training on trauma and trauma-informed care approaches? You know, one of the things about this type of treat this treatment is that it shouldn't just be a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. So is it built into your budget as a system to think about that? Are there built into your budget to actually change the environment? Maybe the colors on the wall are like a really ugly color. Maybe you should change that. Is there money in your budget to be able to do that and address that? 
an evaluation because in order, you know, one of the things about doing the work, you also know is, is the work actually lead to improvements, which is one of the, so I'm putting the plug in for the evaluations and the questionnaires. That's how we know if this intervention is actually working. But so what are the process in place to solicit feedback to always again understand and learn is this concept that we're teaching, is it working and changing things for you? And so some of the best practices in treatment of patients with trauma from care and IPB, um, you know, there's more to come. So we have, again, uh, an eight, this is the kickoff starting talk of an eight part lecture series, webinar series on trauma informed care. Um, but we'll be talking about language. We'll talk about how you believe in validation. We'll be talking about emotion regulation and skills, how to be mindful of triggers, how to assess for suicide or homicide risk or using of substances, thinking about the brain and biology and TBI, how to set flexible limits, how to be aware of what's going on and happening with you with vicarious trauma and collaboration. So next week, we have Denise Yen, who's going to be talking about the neuroscience of trauma. We have Kate Walsh, who's going on February 5th, who's going to talk about re-victimization and the ideas of epidemiology behind it and how to um, really work with your clients uh, around that. Um, on February 19th, we have uh, grounding and verbal de-escalation. Uh, and uh, from Dr. Farrah Herbert, who's gonna give us a lot of tools uh, about how to do so. Uh, then we have Betsy Fiddleson, uh, who's gonna talk about suicide assessment and also high risk assessment for mental health disorders. Uh, then we have uh, Margarita Guzman, who's gonna talk about working with the marginalized populations. Uh, training seven is going to be on vicarious trauma with Dr. Tamara Lavi and Rosa Wachinko is about vicarious trauma and, re and resiliency too. And then finally, we'll finish off with a, a case discussion of trauma-informed legal work where all the questions, if we don't get to any of the, uh, some, if we don't get the majority of them today, we'll also be tabulating them and putting them all together throughout the series. Um, and training eight will be a really hands-on experience of, of really what do we do when X, Y, and Z happen. So we're really excited about that. Um, so with that being, please take the post-session evaluation and I'll open up for questions. Great, great. So we have a few questions. Um, a couple came in around mandated reporting, which is I don't think is a surprise because as we were preparing all of these training series, we had lawyers and mental health experts and this is still an area of interest to us too. Um, so we have some questions first. Um, as, as you mentioned, Uju, mental health um, providers are mandated reporters and so are lawyers like DAs when the person reporting to them isn't their client and is a complaining witness, right? Privilege attaches and that confidentiality to not report attaches when you're that person's client, um, attorney, who's disclosing to you. And so a lot of people have questions around how do you navigate this without losing somebody's trust when you're going to be making a report? Um, how do you handle the fact that by um, making a report and perhaps um, creating new system involvement like ACS, that there may be additional new traumatization of the client? Um, and uh, yeah, have some, some feedback and thoughts. Yeah, you know, great questions. And you know, even as a mandate reporter, I still have those questions myself um, whenever I encounter a client uh, because it is it's hard and, and particularly with you know bringing in a system that is already uh you know can be re-traumatizing but it is also can be historically um you know discriminatory against certain populations i, I do hesitate to uh especially with acs uh when you look at acs and what's going on um there will be there majority of people who are encounter acs are people of color and are of low socioeconomic status and so if a client's coming in, I do think about that. Like, am I, am I more likely, is there bias within me to more like report because of their system? Uh, or is there something else going on? Um, so I do want to recognize that as well, because I do not take reporting very, very lightly. And at the same time, you know, the idea behind the reporting is to make sure that people are safe uh, on top of that. So what I do uh, whenever I encounter a client or have a session with a client, I'm very upfront about uh, confidentiality. Uh, and so that it's not like they're caught off guard. Um, and this may be and applicable to me and, and to whenever you're encountering someone who's not, when you don't share that client um, um, provider privilege, 
but I'm very upfront and say, you know, everything here is confidential except for when I am worried about your safety or I'm worried about the safety of others. And if I am worried about the safety, your safety or the safety of others, I will let you know that about my worries and concerns and we will work together to talk about the next steps in terms of what we need to do. Uh, and so I think oftentimes that is very, very helpful. So patients can make, and clients can make their decisions about when they feel comfortable sharing, but they also know that they're not gonna be caught off guard. Um, and I work with them and um, depending on the situation, I may make the call with them there so they know what I'm saying or I may not, but I always wanna be transparent about it from the very beginning um, that this is the case and that I'm taking their concerns very seriously. And part of it too is that what I've found is that sometimes um, like when you do make that intervention, um, people, sometimes people actually uh, really feel more comfortable like, because they feel like they're being taken seriously. Um, so often like people make comments that, and people may not say, oh, I'm suicidal. No one's taking them seriously. But when you do take them seriously, they feel like that sense of safety that somebody is actually listening to me. Um, and so sometimes, um, when I feel like something's gonna, like that relationship's gonna be uh, impaired, I, sometimes I'm surprised that they actually come back. Um, and I think it really has to do with the fact that I'm, I'm acting in a way in their best interest. I'm trying to let them and act in their way in their best interest. And sometimes it takes a while for them to come back and that's okay and that's the prerogative. Um, but it's really kind of towing that line and, and making sure that you're being transparent, you're working together, you're working, uh, you're working to empower them, but also being upfront about what you can and cannot do. I think it's so important because it kind of underscores this um, message that I think we're trying to get across through all these training series that when we're serving survivors, we really want a network. We want a network of support that's being provided to people. Um, as a lawyer, I, I can't address somebody's um, trauma in terms of like the mental health angle perfectly. I might be able to understand it. I might be able to acknowledge it. I might be able to change my response as a result of it. Um, but, but I can't do that like a mental health expert could. But at the same time, you know, as, as lawyers, if somebody is our direct client, we, we are able to create this really, really significant and impactful space if we use trauma-informed care and create a space where somebody is completely comfortable with disclosing to us, we have a network of support where we aren't reporting. We aren't, as many people say, you know, being a part of this re-traumatization that can happen with system engagement by calling the systems ourselves um, and, and create different spaces for clients to have sec security and access to all of the help that they, they might want. Um, but it is, it is a challenge and a tension that I think we all routinely face. Um, Uju, there was another question um, that came about, which is even if we are able to um, recognize and acknowledge um, that something that might be happening is a trauma response. Um, for example, sometimes we have clients who, um, you know, to them and their experience, there is an emergency. And to us and our experience, we know that there is no legal emergency nor urgent response that we can provide. Um, and you know, there may be many calls, repeated calls every single day for check-ins, or there may be people that avoid calls entirely just as the moment is most important. Um, do you have any tips in terms of how to navigate that? Yeah, no, that's that's very very tricky, and and um, I don't have any universal tips per se because it does depend on the individual and what you're what they're bringing and what's going on. Um, you know, one of the things I'll, that I do say and and ask uh, clients or patients is, um, you know, what is the best way for me to reach out to you? Do you like for me to um, call you at this time or at that time. Sometimes I still like set times when we can talk because um, I think what ends up happening is when a client who's constantly reaching out, and this actually happens a lot with parents of children, uh, when a, a parent will call me assessment because they're anxious, they just want to know the answer. Um, and that fear of not being able to reach me makes it much harder. So they constantly reach me and email me and text me and whatnot. But usually what I do is I'll say, you know, I'm going to set aside um, Tuesday at 8 a.m. where that is your time for 15 minutes, 30 minutes for us to talk about what, any concerns you have. Uh, and for them, that's kind of re release relieves their anxiety because they know like, yes, 
me and Dr. Barry can talk at this time and I can jot down all my questions and she will answer them. So I'm giving them that space. And so sometimes just giving them that space of like, if this time is your time, I will answer it. And it helps me because if I don't feel so flustered with the constant calls and, 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 um, and messaging. Uh, and that uh, that they will be able to be able to be able to have that time, and I can use that dedicated time, dedicated time to talk to them. Um, in terms of when they, a client or a patient may feel like something is much more uh, larger than what I uh, may feel, uh, you know, I use that time to actually ask them themselves and flip it to them. Tell me why you're feeling this way. Uh, you know, what's going on? Does something like this happen to you in the past? Like, what is your fear? Um, and for example, this comes across when I'm prescribing medications, um, you know, I prescribe medications as a psychiatrist and uh, generally I, I, you know, I, it's, it's hard for people to overcome that concern and that stigma, but for the most part, some medications I prescribe are very, um, uh, they're non-toxic and they're actually going to be very helpful. Uh, but people may bring to the table uh, previous misconceptions about what medications are. And so without me hearing what those misconceptions are, I may not know and I may not be able to address their concerns adequately. So for example, um, someone may say, I don't want to take this medication because my sister took it and she became a zombie. That's helpful for me to know um, because then I'm going to answer it differently than if somebody said, I don't want to take this medication because I'm afraid that it's going to, I'm going to have to take it forever. Um, so without me knowing why they're so worried, um, I may not be able to adequately ask them. So you should flip it on them and say, tell me what is causing you biggest concern. And if they can't answer it, I'll probably just say, is it because of X, is it because of Y, is it because of Z? And that can be helpful too. Yes, I think something that so often happens because we, we are all so busy <laughs> um, is that we don't give space for information we don't think is relevant, but you don't know if something's relevant or not until you hear it. And so saving that time to be really focused and allow for people's narratives um, to balance with switching gears and then being more directive is so essential. Um, I'm going to launch uh, the second and last CLE, CLE poll in one minute, and then as soon as I give people one minute to respond to that, Uju, I do have one last question um, with regards to the Family Justice Centers. Um, first, anybody who is an attorney and who would like to um, get CLE credit, please respond to the poll on your screen. Okay, I'm going to give 10 more seconds for the poll. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Uju, um, a great question for you all came up, which somebody was asking, um, do we know of any places where lawyers and mental health care providers are already working together? Um, Yes, for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but before I answer the question, I did get uh, some comments about this barcode that's up on the screen. So this is a barcode for the post-session evaluation. Um, the way to be able to use it is use your camera. I'm assuming people have phones, um, but uh, use your the camera on your phone and hold it up to the screen, and it should um, capture that barcode, and it'll open up uh, a link to um, to a web page that will open up the the survey. So use your camera, point it at the screen, and it should automatically just work magically. Um, but yes, there are places where lawyers and um, mental health professionals are working together, and that's taking place in New York City. Uh, through H&H, uh, &H, through funded by the mayor's office through NYC Thrive, through H&H, which is the largest city public hospital in the country, um, and with the Family Justice Centers in New York City, which is actually the largest con conglomeration of FJCs in the country as well. 
Um, so this was an initiative that was actually started um, in 2014 through funding from a private organization uh, through Columbia University um, and through uh, the Family Justice Centers. One of our speakers, Betsy Bilson, was actually director of that pilot program. And it started in the Bronx when they realized that there was a dirt of psychiatrists and trained um, psychologists who could do evidence-based treatment in mental health care. Um, and they didn't know where to send them. Um, they were sending them out into the wind and sometimes there'd be a wait list of up to 10 hours, I'm oh, sorry, like 10 weeks and sometimes even up to six, six months. Um, and what we realized through this pilot was that there was such a need. There was a huge demand and we were trying to meet that supply. And through funding from the mayor's office and through First Lady Shirley McRae, this initiative was expanded to include all five of the family justice centers in New York City. And so right now what we do is we embed a psychiatrist and a therapist, either a psychologist or social worker, into each of the five family justice centers. And they are, their mandate is to do clinical work, to provide uh, high quality, um, trauma-informed, culturally sensitive, evidence-based treatments for um, survivors of intimate partner violence. In addition to the clinical work, what they also do is do training to the staff at the Family Justice Center. So staff includes lawyers or counselors or caseworkers on mental health, um, on Mental Health 101, on vicarious trauma, on grounding isolation, with a real impact to be able to help bridge that gap and to work collaboratively. So there are a lot of sharing of cases and talking about different cases. And um, in one of our uh, groups in Queens, we actually work together to talk about how to uh, work on trauma narratives with your clients and talk about UVSAs. Uh, because there is a trauma narrative part and that can be really traumatizing to some of our clients. And so uh, how as a lawyer, do you also provide that safe space to be able to do so, do so, what are some skills and, 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 and whatnot. And it's worked really well. I think that overall the, the collaboration, the collaborative uh, opportunity has allowed for people to share stories and to share that burden so you don't feel alone. And then also in terms of just mandated reporting and confidentiality, a lawyer who has that privilege can say, why don't you go talk to this person who has expertise, they're right down the hall, and that could be part of um, helping develop some of that, um, that uh, na nature to be able to provide services to our clients. Great, and we're getting some messages in the chat about other um, collaboratives um, on slightly smaller scales, but, but just as great that are working within communities um, so a lot of a lot of amazing advocates on here, and hopefully there's a way for us to share all of our resources together. Um, I know that there was um, another question um, that that I'm that I just want to note for here, and, and hopefully we can come back to touch on this. Um, but uh, there are people that were asking, are there are there trauma informed principles um, that organizations might be able to look to um, to promote putting into place? Uh, for um, for themselves um, to to navigate uh, providing services along these lines. Yeah, there are. Uh, so SAMHSA um, uh, has developed a core curriculum, not core curriculum, but they have developed um, some training material and some uh, uh, reading material on trauma informed care and what are some of the trauma informed care tenants. And so my presentation today kind of leaned heavily on some of the sense of principles. So the four core tenants, the, you know, recognize, respond, resist, re-traumatization. Um, and then also the piece of the universe precautions also lean heavily on, on that as well. Um, and so to point to SAMHSA, and I'll actually include that in the Google Drive too, some of those key reports that you can utilize for your organization. Um, but the idea is really more, and I think maybe we can bring this to maybe one of our topics, topic eight, about how do you do that as an organization? Because each organization is different. Um, your culture, your style, who's in charge is different. And so, you know, how do you take these principles and add them to uh, that makes it relevant to your job and to your workplace. And there are certain questions that are in those reports that can help you think about them more thoroughly. Okay, so we have a few other questions. And as um, you mentioned earlier, we do have in our eighth um, session of this training series, we're going to be folding in questions that come in throughout the other seven trainings so that we can really provide some in-depth practical advice um, for people engaging 
with survivors in their practice. Um, but for now, I'm gonna close the question and answer if there's nothing else further and turn it back to you for any last minute thoughts. Great, well, thank you, Shawnee, and thank you, everybody, so for taking the time on a Friday afternoon um, after a very busy week for many people. That was a very exciting week for some people, too, with the inauguration to join us here and be particularly present with what we have to say. Um, and, you know, this was just scratched the surface of uh, what we know about trauma-informed care, and uh, I think that the rest of the sessions will be as equally as engaging, hopefully as engaging um, and, and informative, uh, and that you'll be able to take some of these key principles to your organizations. The other piece that came out that I think was really exciting is like, how do we share amongst ourselves too about what's working at other sites and this site? Because I think um, we can't do this work alone, nor should we do this work alone. We should definitely build up on, on the key tenets of what other people are doing. So, um, with that said, let's end and then we'll reconvene next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.